So your definition is we do it to ourselves. We do it a lot of it. Yes. Now I mean the system isn't, you know, that's somebody who works with it. It didn't set up for you to win. I'm not gonna. I'm not. Now you know that. that regard. Yeah. yeah. You know, I don't, I don't sit here and make believe on that part. But a lot of times we put ourselves in the situation. Mm. So when they're in my office and I'm doing these hearings and it was just like the other day, you know, hey man, am I getting ready to go back to prison? Yeah, you're getting ready to go back. But you know, we got to get into a point to where we're not in somebody's office or in somebody's courtroom, depending on them to show some mercy or some leniency or even some discretion. We got to start putting ourselves in that situation. Yeah, period, period. You know, be proactive and not reactive and just not be in this situation on things that you can avoid. You could have went to work. You signed out of the center three days to go to work. You could have went to work. Right. You chose not to go to work. So now don't sit in my office with the alligator tears and tell me about all this stuff you got going on, <laughs> you know, personally, and why you don't need to go back to prison when you could have avoided this. Accountability. You know, it got to be accountability. Accountability and responsibility. Yeah, I'm, I'm liking it. I get <laughs> all the index cards. <laughs>
being that it was a stranger, she didn't have any vested interest in saying something that wasn't going to hurt my feelings mm. or, or saying something that was going to make me feel a certain kind of way. She just said what it was. And, you know, she okay. just gave me an unbiased opinion just, and, you know, that really made me just kind of sit back and think about, okay, well, you know, maybe, you know, maybe I have more accountability in that than, than what I wanted to acknowledge or accept initially. Let, let me stop you because <clears throat> I'm confused. So I know people may be confused. When you say accountability, we're talking about your mother's death or we're talking about something else? So like, I, how, how so you I, accountability? My, my grief counseling actually started as grief counseling. Okay. I initially went after my mother passed to kind of deal with that. But like I said, at the same time, I was having issues in my marriage as well. Got you. Okay, I got so you. So we kind of ended up really oh, more so focused because, you know, like she said, it's only so much you can do about the death. Right. You know, it, it, we can't go back and change that. So we had to shift gear to focus on things that I could change, things that were within my control. Within, and that part was the relationship aspect, that kind of thing. Absolutely. All right. So give me at least one pivotal moment to help somebody in mourning that your counselor taught you. Let me ask you this first. Mm. Are the stages of death, um, anger, bargaining, um, acceptance, those, I forgot all five, but did you go through those? Absolutely. Anger, bargaining. I forgot the middle two, and then acceptance is the last piece. Right. You felt, were, you, were you angry at first? Very angry. Did you question God? Absolutely. You did? Absolutely. Yeah. It happened. Absolutely. Yeah. And what got you out of that? Uh, my, my views on that on religion is a little different than most anyway. Okay. Um, I always have been, even, oh. you know, prior to. Uh, but, you know, now it's just, I accept things. You know, mm -hmm. I, I'm not naive to think people are going to live forever. Correct. Um, and so I think you just really got to get to a point to where, you just got to accept that. And you just got to understand that it's just part of life. And, okay. you know, no matter what time it happens, you're never going to be ready for it. It's never, it's always going to be too early. Right. Um, so once you get that point, you, you can push it. Yeah, yeah, you got to move on. You just can't focus on things that you can't really control. But like I said, you don't overcome it. You right. just kind of adjust, adjust to it. You feel like you're still here in spirit? Sometimes. Do you believe that? On, on days that I need to. Right. On days that I need Because that's not something that I just genuinely buy into but you know I, I can grasp the concept on days that i need to grasp that concept i understood so. understood okay so pivotal relationship uh moment or um a bullet that she gave you about your relationship regarding your responsibility your role in it what you learn as a man that you may have done that got you to that point where y'all needed therapy that i wasn't always right hmm. you know that i had to be open to see other perspectives my, my spouse's viewpoints on certain things mm -hmm. and um, even while my attentions may have been good how i went about it may not have been been the best way let me ask you this they say never make important decisions while you're grieving do you think that the two when you were losing your mother or your mother you lost your mom it may have affected the relationship oh, absolutely. that all that was intertwined absolutely yeah 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 when you have something like that going on you can't it's hard to deal with multiple things correct you know in some of them that magnitude but I would definitely agree with that. Yeah. Don't make any major decisions when you're going through a heavy grief like that. Exactly. It's not going to make not the right decision. You think there'll be something you would keep <clears throat> doing even if you don't quote unquote? Like, is it just, is it good? In other words, is it, okay, I got what I need and I'm okay? Or is it something that you think you'll just keep visiting? I think a person should stay in therapy as long as they need it. Mm -hmm. as, as long, I mean, mm -hmm. it's, you know, for some, there may be just to get through that situation. For some, it may be a continual thing that they need to just continually talk to somebody. Um, you know, for me, I, I did it um, when my mother initially passed, and uh, then me and my wife eventually did couples counseling. We did that for about a year or so. Mm -hmm. And, when, you know, when we got to a point where we felt, okay, hey, we can kind of wean ourselves off, we did. You did it. Uh, but I think that, you know, we're both open. If we needed to do it again, we'll, we'll do it again. Is this something you refer back to? Like, like when y'all get into an argument now, and things get a little, you know, Rocky, is it like, wait, no, this, this, do either one of y'all go, I just did it in the therapy, day. we see it. I just did it the other day. <laughs> <laughs> we, we got into an argument, and I refer it back to therapy. But, but I, th I think it's good, because yeah. we did learn some good things in the therapy. You got a and, reference. Uh, you know, you, you, you got to retain that stuff, right? Yeah. Otherwise, it's kind of, it's kind of voided. It's waste. You don't. It's kind of a waste of time. So, um, we don't do it often, because we don't want to argue often. So, therapy worked in that regard, but... Uh, I, yeah, I just actually I just referenced something we did in therapy the other day. My man. That's not the. That's <laughs> <a> man. <laughs> so the goal you is said, to get a lot of index cards on the ground. That's not the goal. Not I mean, it's nothing you shoot for. Even though some people, you know, when they leave, I got a whole 
stack left. Okay. But some people, when they leave, have none left. Okay. The goal is to get you at least to the middle. To the middle. No, I'm just being funny. <laughs> so, man, let's talk about what you do for a living. Halfway house. Talk to people about what exactly the halfway house <clears throat> is. Let's help some young men, period. I don't care if you're black, white, young ladies as well come through Absolutely. the halfway house. People don't understand on a federal level what the halfway house is. What is the halfway house? And let's talk about how you got there. So the halfway house is the point between getting out of the institution and going back into your community. Okay. So we're supposed to be there as like the little bridge, right? Um, so we assist in everything from employment, obviously, is you know, one of the most important aspects of transition. and To help them, uh, help them get a job. Help them get a job. Okay. Uh, not just a job, but valuable employment. Um, okay. Uh, family reunification. Uh, educational goals. So we look at you know what the what the individual has going on <laughs> education wise. Okay. Now a lot of our program is mandated, but you know, uh, see it this is for the their part, benefit. This is the part, right? A lot of it is mandated. It's mandated, but it's for their benefit. Okay. You know, so sometimes you have to force people to do things even for themselves. Like the seatbelt law, right? The seatbelt is for your benefit, but it's mandatory. You got to wear it. Correct. And it's for your protection. So we're the same way. You know, sometimes we got to force you to take a program that we feel is going to be beneficial for you and you know the goal the hope is that you will buy into it but if not you know that's fine too uh, we've done our part we, we tried and you end up back possibly where you start and then we call it job security we'll see you again <laughs> <laughs> you, you y'all, y'all miss that you call that job security <laughs> i mean there'll always be somebody I'll always be somebody if you're unwilling to change we always have a place for you um, but for those who are willing to come in and do something different then we got something for you as well. Steve, let me ask you a question. Let's talk about this job placement real quick. How can a person that you guys, not you guys, but that is labeled a felon, mm-hmm. did time, do you believe that they can continue to do time even though they serve their time, they're still doing time even though they're free because they can't get a good job because of the felony? But then that excuse would have been a lot more relevant 10, 15 years ago, uh, not so much today. You know, employers are not as, uh, what's the word I want to use? Res- uh, strict, not strict, but. They, they're a lot more relaxed about hiring somebody with, with if you have the skill set. And, you know, and that's what it boils down to. Uh, a lot of employers don't care where you acquired it from. And, you know, what you did in between, now, there's just something that some offense employers just don't want to deal with. Right. Uh, but, I mean, just because just you have a felon now, that's not as big of a barrier as it used to. When I first started doing this 15 years ago, right. that was an issue. You know, that was a big thing. You have a lot of guys losing a lot of good opportunities for jobs because of that label. Right. And I'm not saying that it doesn't happen now. Right. I mean, obviously it does. Um, so, you know, the whole ban the box, you know, uh, campaign that was going on, definitely supportive of that. I don't think that that's something that necessarily needs to be considered when you're talking about giving someone a job. Now, wait, I don't know what that. Talk, talk to me about so that. So the ban the box campaign. The ban the box, B-A-Y? A ban, yeah, ban, B-A-N. Ban, ban okay, ban the box. Oh, ban the box. Ban the box. What does that so mean? So ban the box campaign was, uh, it actually started here in Georgia, where the campaign to where they would, on state application, any state government job, they wouldn't ask that question. It oh, period. Actually, yeah, you wouldn't be able to ask that question on okay. the application. Um, Did it work? It did work. It did work. Meaning um, we no longer they have on, on state applications, you don't see that question on there. Mm. And so that's, you know, that, that works on state applications. But in the private sector, you know, you're, you're still able to ask that, ask that question on your gotcha. application. Okay. Uh, and like I said, I did, when I first started with this, I did employment. You know, I was the employment specialist. Um, and I would, you know, the, the resident would go out and get the job. And you know, then now we got to call the employee and tell them, well, hey, you know, uh, this person convicted felon. They're in the halfway house. Mm. But, yeah, well, you know, I didn't know that. Uh, so a lot of times it wouldn't even be just here to the, the felony conviction itself, but either the resident didn't know how to adequately do the job. have that conversation about that. Oh, I got you. Uh, or they weren't forthcoming about it. Like, you know, like I told them, they shouldn't hear it the first time coming from us. Mm. You know, you've said in the interview with them, you've gone through the application process. At some point, you've got to bring that up because you know we got a call if you're in our the, program. The resident. The resident. Okay. If you're in the halfway house. I'm not referring to somebody that's in the community, but mm-hmm. you know in the halfway house, we got to contact these people. Mm-hmm. They shouldn't hear that the first time coming from us. I got you. So, okay. you know, we would do a lot of training on, you know, how to have that conversation with employers, how to navigate 
uh, your way through that conversation. Okay. Um, to where you're not focusing on a lot on, you know, what you did or whether or not you felt like you should have been in prison or not. You know, we're past that point. Gotcha. Uh, we focused on, hey, this is what happened. This is what I learned from, and this is where I am now. So how did you, you said 15 years. Talk to me about how a person like yourself, a young man watching that may want to be in law enforcement, how, how did you start off um, and how did you end up being the director of the whole facility? Where'd you start? I started as a resident monitor here in Atlanta. Oh, um, resident monitor, not a resident. No, 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 no. <laughs> not, 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 <laughs> not a resident, no, 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 we don't, we, we don't hire convicted felons. <laughs> so, uh, Y'all don't hire convicted We don't hire convicted felons. Okay. Uh, conflict <laughs> of interest. Okay, so um, monitor. But, uh, yeah, start off as a resident monitor, fresh out of college. Um, I didn't really even know what halfway houses were, to mm -hmm. be honest. Mm -hmm. and I, you know, we, we both know that I've had a family member to go through that. So I was familiar with it from that stance that of it. Okay. Um, but other than that, I wasn't very familiar with it. But I had a cousin who was a federal probation officer at the time. And he knew the lady at the time that was over the halfway house and he made a phone call for me. I got the interview, went in and got the job and uh, was a monitor for about two weeks. And then right. promoted up to employment specialist. and. Did that for a little over a year and uh, promoted up to counselor from there. And then I began traveling a little bit with the company. Okay. So went back home to Memphis and was a counselor in Memphis for a while. And then from Memphis went to Savannah. In Savannah, I was a social service coordinator. So, so you, you, you moving on up in I, this. I, 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 I had to move to move right. on. You know, I <laughs> wasn't okay. like I was able to just stay at one center. And, okay. Uh, so from Savannah, went to Orlando. I was actually, that was my first that. facility that I was a director of was in Orlando. Um, stayed there for a couple of years, and then the opportunity came to come to Atlanta, which is our biggest facility. So, of course, there was some financial benefits of that. Okay. And, um, and you know, it's closer to home. So, you know, you know, me and my wife were both from Memphis. So, Atlanta's a lot closer to Memphis than Orlando. Of so, course. Um, of course. You know, just made the decision to move down. And so, let me ask you this: <clears throat> Why do you feel like? Do you have more black residents, brown residents, or white residents? Oh, man, you know. They I don't look know. like us. They us. look like us. Okay. They look like us. Why do you feel like that's the issue? Why do we have more black and brown residents? Well, I mean, that's a, man, that's a complex question. It's a complex question. Uh, but you're a smart guy. There are various reasons we have. I mean, one, we can look at sentencing, you know, uh, Guideline. guidelines and, and, and targeted guidelines for certain communities. Uh, but I mean, I go before that, I, you know, I go back to, it starts at the house, man. We, we've got to get to a point to where, you know, we're going back and we're teaching our children, you know, stuff like I learned growing up, basic respect, you know, for authority, whether you like the person or not. That's uh, right. Agree with the decision or not. Uh, we've got to keep our kids active and doing things. You know, my mom's philosophy was, I'm going to keep y'all so busy you don't have time to get in trouble. Right, I think right, kids right. have way too much free time on their hands. Um, we rely a lot on social media and, and to keep TV busy. to keep them busy. Mm -hmm. And I think mm -hmm. we need to give them more constructive things to do. And then uh, accountability. We've got to hold each other accountable. You know, when I was growing up, we didn't do certain things in the community, not because our mothers were there, but somebody who knew our mom may be there. Right, right, and right. We would get in trouble from them just like we would if it was our mother. Right. Uh, but these days, you know, you can't do that. You can't say nothing to nobody's child. child. Right. Uh, it's going to solve the whole issue. And so people just be like, man, listen. It ain't you know, I, you know, I've known your mom for 10 years, but I'm not going to say nothing to you because I don't feel like dealing with it. Right, right. Uh, well, it was just, and it was different, you know, when I was growing up. Like, you can get it two or three times before it even gets to your mom. What by far is plaguing? Most of the people that come in, if I had to pick, I would say drugs, but tell me if I'm wrong. What by far are the crimes that lead the way to the federal institution? Drugs and weapons. Period. Drugs and weapons. Drugs and weapons. And how much time have you seen a person, give me a success story of a person who did a whole bunch of time, came through the halfway house, and now they're doing exceptionally well. Do you have any of those examples? Absolutely. I, I, I spoke to three occasions. I, I, met a, <clears throat> I remember meeting one guy. I spoke to you, you've invited me three times to speak to the residents, and I appreciate it every time. Mm -hmm. But I, I remember one success story, but tell me, is, is this is him? Go ahead. Uh, we've got a guy that, you know, right now is still very involved with our facility. Uh, he did 12 years, and when he came to the halfway house, he had about a year worth of, of school to finish up on his uh, associate's degree. Okay. And so he was able to finish that while he was with us. And once he finished with us, he went on and got his bachelor's degree. And now he is a um, human resources manager for a major, I won't say the company, but mm -hmm. 
for a major distribution company here in Atlanta. HR Atlanta. hired him. HR hired him, man. Is he <laughs> with his convicted felon? So like I said, <laughs> 10, 15 years ago, right. the whole, oh, I'm a convicted felon, I can't get a good job. Right. That was a valid complaint. You know, now, not so much. I'm just going to say, man, if you got a felony on your record or whatever, go for it. Go like, for at it. least at least go for it. I think some people don't even, when they know they're a convicted felon, they don't even fill out the application. They don't even go for it. So at least give them the opportunity to tell you no. Especially if you have a skill set. Yeah. If you, like, they can care less where you acquired the skill set from. If you can get in there, you can run a, a forklift or whatever. Like, they don't they don't care. You can drive a, a, a semi-truck. They don't care where they you learn how to do that from. I got you. You know, uh, so that's why, you know, we really, when I go into the prisons and we do, you know, different little orientation, I tell them, don't sit around here and do nothing. You know, if they're offering different certifications, and get it. Them, get them. It's get free. Them. When you come out. When you come out, those are useful. Right. Employers don't care where you got the skill set from. You were the kitchen manager for the prison, man. You cook for a thousand inmates. Period. A restaurant doesn't care where you got that, that experience from. Can you serve a thousand people in an hour? Then, yes. Yeah, we want to hire you. Got so, you. I mean, a lot, like I said, a lot of times it's just about putting yourself out there. And then know how to navigate through that conversation when you do have to have that conversation with that employer. All right, let's go to the other extreme. Person did all this time and then want to come to you and still at the fool. Does that happen? You would think by the time a person's getting there in the halfway house, they're ready to start getting back into society. You ever seen a person, they do like, they so institutionalized, they violate on purpose, Absolutely. they'd rather go back. Give me a situation where a person, what kind of violation can they have at the halfway house that'll send them back? And why would they do that? And, and like, I know I'm like, that's a, a common sense person's question who's never been locked up. But does that happen more often than not? On a weekly basis, I would say, because I don't send people back to prison, okay? They send themselves back to prison. <laughs> I just arrange for transportation. But I arrange transportation of at least, on an average, about three inmates a week. Three inmates a week back. go back? At least go back. At least. How many, let's put it from the perspective, how many are housed? Um, I have 300 right now in my program. 300 in the program. Over 300 residents. And three a week go back At least to prison. Three. At least. That's a quiet week. If you if you violate, you got to go back and do all your time? It depends. On the violation? Uh, it depends on the violation. It depends on whether or not we're going to take you back into the halfway house. Uh, depending on if you're in, you know, if you got time out there. Like, there are different programs in the federal system uh, that you can get time off from. But, you know, part of that agreement is completing a portion at the halfway house. So then if you're unsuccessful, then you have to go back and forfeit that time. Uh, so it just depends on, you know, individual circumstances. And The last three, for example, what did they do to go back? <laughs> uh, one, young, one guy signed out for work for three days, didn't go to work. You know, <laughs> just, you know, just little little silly stuff. Um, so wait, 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 wait. Signed out for work, meaning he, to y'all. He, he, left, he left the facility saying he was going to work. Right. Uh, and the way it came about is he was in, his, in the restroom at, what we call curfew hour. So at that point, everybody's supposed to be in the bed. Right. Uh, one of the monitors walking through, he's in the restroom on the phone. Uh, you know, because we do allow them to have cell phones now, which is the change from even when you were coming. You know, we didn't right. do cell phones. Right. Uh, I was coming as, as a speaker. As a speaker. Right. So, <laughs> okay. uh, yeah. So in the, in the restroom on the cell phone, during the time, so our policy is, man, we confiscate the cell phone. We confiscate the cell phone, we're automatically going to search it. So we're going through the cell phone and, you know, we got pictures and videos here at his mama's house. And, you know, we look at the text messages and he's got arrangements. And now at this point, contact the employer. Say, so, hey, you know, can you send us a time card for this particular week? Send us a time card. And sure enough, there are three days on there he, to where he signed out of the facility for, you know, nine and ten hours at a time. And didn't go uh, to work. And not go to work. So, unfortunately, he's been charged with an escape. That's an escape? That's an escape. That's an escape. We don't know where your we don't know where you were during that time frame, and the definition of in, in, in escape on the federal system is not <laughs> you leaving and not coming back. It's that hey, for a certain duration of time, where your whereabouts unknown, and so he far what exceeded. Kind of time can he get for that? That's the administrative. No, because he it's not like he ran off and didn't come back. Okay. So if he ran off and came back, there would be a whole nother chart. Right, like right. He'll be a whole new indictment. Uh, it's still an administrative issue. So he'll probably lose about. 41 some good days, you know. Okay. Um, so then he, he could have gotten out. Then, then he would have got out. So what he had extend his place in about a little over a month or so. Okay, what else has a person done? What's the dumbest thing you ever seen a person violate? I hate to interrupt, but we got to take a break. I got to pay some bills. This segment was sponsored by the Instincts Training Series. Do you guys know you are the highest form of intelligence watching this video? That means you're a human being. Well, God created other animals as well. 
There are millions of other species, and I teach you how to tap into your instincts by using what God gave them and their survival mechanisms so you can reach your full potential. Do me a big favor. Visit BrianNBing.com. That's BrianNBing.com for a glimpse and a free keynote into our instincts training series, and I'll see you guys on the other side. Now enjoy the rest of the episode. Uh, well, we can use one of the examples of when you came and spoke to uh, to our guys. You know, we had the whole little formal graduation. Yes, yes, and I can. One of the little young guys you were asking me about afterwards, I said, man, you'll never believe it. He, the, the night of the graduation came back in, gave him UA and tested positive for marijuana. And asked him, oh, man, I ate a, my, my sister brought me a weed brown I ate on the way to the graduation dinner. So he's done. We graduated, gave the certificates. You do a urine analysis. He, he violated. Goes back to prison. He went back to prison. He went back to prison. He's actually come back through the program twice since then. <laughs> unfortunately. But, uh, <laughs> but yeah. yeah. So, so your definition is we do it to ourselves. We do it to A lot of it, yes. Now, I mean, the system isn't, you know, as someone who works with it, it isn't set up for you to win. I'm not going to, I'm not naive you know in that, that regard. Yeah. yeah. I'm not, you know, I don't, I don't sit here and make believe on that part. But a lot of times we put ourselves in the situation. Mm. So when they're in my office and I'm doing these hearings and it was just like the other day, you know, hey, man, am I getting ready to go back to prison? Yeah, you're getting ready to go back. But, you know, we got to get into a point to where we're not in somebody's office or in somebody's courtroom, depending on them to show some mercy or some leniency or even some discretion. We got to start putting ourselves in that situation. Yeah, period, period. You know, be proactive and not reactive and just not be in this situation on things that you can avoid. You could have went to work. You signed out of the center three days to go to work. You could have went to work. Right. You chose not to go to work. So now don't sit in my office with the alligator tears and tell me about all this stuff you got going on, <laughs> you know, personally, and why you don't need to go back to prison when you could have avoided this. Accountability. You know, it got to be accountability. Accountability and responsibility. Yeah, I'm, I'm liking it. I get it. <laughs> all the index So, but yeah, we got okay. to be accountable for what we do. And, you know, in his family, his mom, you know, she that you know he's not supposed to be at the house. You know, we, we send out a whole family orientation. Yeah, 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 yeah. They they you know, so when you know they're not supposed to be doing certain things and they're in that situation, don't help them do it. Don't help them do it. Hold them accountable. Hey man, are you supposed to be here? Mm -hmm. You know, you need to go where you're supposed to go. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, I would rather you come home when you're supposed to come home than you sneak into the house and die at the risk of you going back to prison. Right, exactly. So. Biggest railroad situation you've seen. You have you seen a person that in your honest opinion, unjust shouldn't be here but i gotta do my job but in your opinion if you read the file what like, what you do what you doing here oh yeah um a couple of them. i mean like i've been doing this for 15 years so you see it a lot but i can remember when i first transferred back to atlanta as a director um uh, had a guy you know i didn't know any i didn't know any of the residents um but the guy was on home confinement so i get in you know first day in the office i'm just getting my paperwork and stuff so Get off the fax machine. It's a positive UA. It's positive for um, I forget what he tested positive right. for. Um, that's, that's your analysis. Your analysis. Sorry. Right. He, on, uh, he on ankle. He was on ankle at, monitor at, at the house. Okay. Uh, so I get the UA. It's positive. So I tell the staff, Hey, you know, where's his resident? Oh, he's a home confinement. Hey, call him in. Let him know he needs to report back to the facility. You got a positive UA. I mean, they're all shocked. Are you sure? Because you know he, he it's just really surprising. He's such a good guy. Within the uh, white collar crime. Okay. I say, hey, man, I don't you know. I don't know the guy. You just need to report back in. You know, I, like, I don't, <laughs> we ain't got no resume. I don't know all of that. Uh, so anyway, get the guy back, and uh, I'm not meeting with him. He's a nice guy, like legitimately a nice guy. I'm like, right, right. Well, man, I was like, but man, so you, you know, it's a whole UA. You like, can't, you, you, you can't. You produce the sample, you sign, like it's. In your, so come to find out, his mom had made him some Jamaican black. He tested part of alcohol. Mom had made him some Jamaican black cake. It had rum in it. Ah. She wasn't thinking. He wasn't thinking. Uh, he eats the cake, come in, tastes positive on the UA for the for alcohol. Um, he's in the drug program, okay? So he got a year off of his sentence, but part of that is he has to successfully complete six months at the halfway house. Well, now, back in the day, this is when the Bureau would send you back. You know, mm -hmm. first instance, even for alcohol, Done. you're gone. Mm -hmm. I gotta do my job, right? I can't just not report it just because you tell your mom gave you some black. I don't know if she gave you some cake for real or not. <laughs> but I mean, I really believed him. Right. His mom came with it. She bought the cake up there. Uh, taste the cake. You were talking, no matter. Like I be listen. I believe all of that. But at the end of the day, oh man, he's not supposed to have that cake. Uh, so you know, I, reluctantly, I sent it up. They came and picked the guy up. He had to do his year. 
he ended up filtering back through the half a house after he went through and did like nine months of that year. And uh, I would expect him to be really disgruntled. He was fine. Uh, he came in, he was like, well, you did your job. You know, it, it, no ill feelings. He's like, you know what, and I needed that. Right, you know, like for right, whatever, right. like I was kind of, like I wasn't doing anything illegal or anything like that, like, but I needed to refocus. And he ended up, he's written two books and given me a copy of both of those books. Uh, so but I mean, you, I'm talking about a railroad situation where a person shouldn't even be in the system. In the system, period. Yeah. Like that's a, that's a unique situation. <laughs> um, I've heard of a situation well, not in the system, period, but I've heard of several situations where uh, people get caught up in conspiracy just because two people, one person introduced another person to a person. Conspiracy they, is probably one of the, you, the it, it's, that's it's a, tough. It's, it's a tough one to be. Yeah. Because it's so, it's, it takes so little to get a conspiracy Caught up in charge. a conspiracy. Uh, Me and you can get caught up in a conspiracy. Absolutely. If I, absolutely. if I introduce you and I don't know that y'all, what y'all about to do and it come out that I introduced y'all and y'all did a drug deal. I have to kind of fight to prove that that wasn't my intent on introducing y'all. Absolutely. Conspiracy cases. Like, have you seen a person that went through the program that after you understood everything, you shouldn't be in here? Or you believe guilty? Well, no, I, but I do believe that there's a difference between being innocent and not guilty. Yes, that's true. You know, so why you may not have necessarily been guilty, but you would, for them to even be looking at you to get a conspiracy charge, you probably doing something. <laughs> I mean, uh, uh, and uh, you know, I hate to, to make you lose any more street cred with your, with your people, but I mean, that's just that's just the facts. Like, they're not gonna come and look at Brian for selling drugs if you're not out here dealing with nobody just selling drugs. So if they begin to look at you to even link you to a conspiracy, you I, probably I, are doing a little something. Now again, I'm I gave you the guilty. conspiracy. I gave you the conspiracy example. I shouldn't have. I mm. usually don't try to jade your answers, mm. but. Okay, forget conspiracy. Has anybody come through that you said shouldn't be here? I have not in my 15 years. I, and I'm, you know, not to say that there hasn't been. Okay. I have not ran across one that I was just like, okay, man, this guy is just completely innocent. Well, I have not. I have not. You no. believe it? Now, there, I've seen some that I think have gotten way too much time. Right. You know, know for what it was. Right. Um, I think I've seen people who have gotten, who I think should have gotten more time. Right. For what they did. Right. Or what they were accused of and found guilty by right. the jury of their peers in most cases. Um, <laughs> Nobody just, you shouldn't be. A here. complete innocent person? Nah. Not I yet. mean, I just, and I'm not saying that they're not out there. Right. I mean, the system isn't perfect. You know, right. it's, it's, it's ran by humans and we're not perfect. There are going to be mistakes that are going to be made. Uh, but I think more times than not. We it's not right. prison. They're on the way out. You ever had any fights, any incidents? It, it, it is it's prison. prison. Oh, it's considered prison. It's, it's prison. Okay, let me change it. It's not the penitentiary. It's not the penitentiary. It's not the institution. It's not the institution. But we are a correctional facility. So it's, it's prison. I, I like to remind them of that. <laughs> we are a correctional facility. Let's, let's not forget that. <laughs> okay. No, because sometimes you, if you don't... The walls be kind of down. You, you, you forget that, and it, then people get too comfortable, mm -hmm. and then they begin to... Elevate you know, their... You know, kind of, yeah. Yeah. It's, so you got to remind them. You got to remind them. It's a correctional but facility. But fighting... Sneak drug, like, do you have to deal with? And these guys are on the way back to society. Young ladies on the way back to society. Do you get, do you deal with that kind of thing? You ever had any fights or anything? Uh, I actually just had my first fight about two years ago. Uh, Why are they fighting at the halfway house? The they're people, on the way out. People can't hold their liquor, so then they're doing something else they're not supposed to be doing. Uh, was drinking, and uh, you know, one white guy thought he was cool he was sitting around with some brothers and thought it was going to be cool to start dropping some n words because. You know, they were all drinking together. And <laughs> shouldn't have been drinking. Shouldn't have been drinking. Right. And uh, that didn't go well. So we had a little scuffle in the bathroom. And everybody uh, got to go back. Everybody go. Win or lose. <laughs> everybody go. You're involved, you got to go. You got to go. Because, uh, you know, it's just too comfortable. <laughs> okay. It's too comfortable. And, and, and that's not the kind of environment we're trying to foster. So. Okay, okay. If you're involved in that kind of activity, I need to get you up out of here. The ladies. The ladies. Is this a co-ed facility? We're a co-ed facility. How do you keep the ladies and gentlemen, got them done 25 years, young lady did 10 years, how do you keep them from fraternizing? We don't. We want them to fraternize. Part of their transition is, you know, getting used to normality, right? And okay. it's not normal to only be around people of the same sex. So right. You do have to learn how to conduct yourself around the opposite gender. Now, we don't promote, encourage, nor allow relationships. relationships. Right. Uh, but yeah, we want you to socialize with them. You know, sit down. Y'all can sit down and eat with each other. You can go out and smoke cigarettes with each other. Right. Walk around with it. You know, sit in the common areas, play cards. You know, we want you to get back into that into that habit of knowing how to conduct yourself around.
people of the opposite sex. What are most of the women in for? Anything consistent? <sighs> Same thing, really, drugs. You know, you see more fraud cases with women. Really? Um, but a lot of times it's, it's drug cases. It probably stem back to somebody that they were dealing with. Uh, you know, some type of significant other uh, mm. that they were dealing with and assisting more so with what they had going on and got caught up. Got caught up in it. Yeah. Okay. The children. How have you seen the prison, penitentiary, institution, halfway house, uh, house arrest, whatever, probation, how have you seen it uh, break down our communities? Yeah. Have you seen the children? How have you seen that manifest in our generation? I mean, it removes the parent from the home. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, you can't really raise your child from prison. Right. Uh, so a lot of times, you know, when the parent does come back home, there's a lack of respect, you know, from the child. Resentment. Uh, you haven't been there. Mm -hmm. Resentment, mm -hmm. anger. Mm -hmm. uh, so you can't even begin to parent because you got to work through all of that. You can't just discredit it and say, well, hey, you know, I'm your mom or I'm your dad. Right, coming in running. You just got to deal. No, like you really have to then kind of adjust yourself to their life. They don't have to adjust to yours. Mm. Um, and, you know, a lot of times, you know, parents... You know, when they go back into their home, they, they really, especially with the men, you know, you see it a lot more so uh, with our male population, mm -hmm, you know, mm -hmm. having that difficulty in finding what their role is going to be in their, in their household. You mm -hmm. know, like I tell them, I said, man, you know, they, they, that woman and those children, they've been maintaining and holding it down the last 10, 15 years. Without you. you can't just come in. Mm -hmm and start dictating, you know, your way out of highway type situation. You know, and a lot of times, that's how it was prior to them going in. Mm -hmm. You know, they were the breadwinners, they were the providers, they were doing all of, you know, so things kind of went how they wanted it to go. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, that's shame. You know, you spent the last 10 years with them putting money on your books. <laughs> and, and, and sending you stuff, so, right. uh, you know, you don't get to come home and disrupt the whole dynamic the, that, in that, that what's been going on. That makes sense. Uh, that makes sense. And that's difficult for It's reversed, yeah. yeah it's, it's difficult. You know, most women, they're going to try to mend their relationship with those children. Right. You know, they're, right. they're going to kind of make that really more of a point than what I see. Right. Um, you know, most men are kind of like, man, you know, they, they, they man, because I went to prison, you know, they're going to have to just get over there. Well, no, nah, they don't just have to get over there. Like, you've got to work your be way patient and work, their, and work your way back into their life. Do you feel, before we go, do you feel like, um, I heard a gentleman say that, that did some time that anything over... 10 years is too long. And what I mean by that is, all right, I do my 10 years. But when you start giving out 35 years, 45 years on a drug case, I'm talking about a nonviolent, even if I was a kingpin, nonviolent, let's just say first offense, 30, 40 years, you know, what we call football numbers. Do you think 10 years and then maybe programs and helping the person is better than 10 years in the, I mean, better than 35 years in the penitentiary? For those type of offenses? Yes. Yes. For those, I, I, That's you know, a long I, time. I don't, I don't see any non-violent drug offense that warrants 30, 30 years. years. Like, right. that's just, I, when I first started as a counselor here in Atlanta, I had this, and it was a white guy, older white guy. Um, he got caught with marijuana plants. He right. had like 50 plants. Okay. In the federal system, they charge you with the what the plant has the ability to make. <laughs> so based on what the 50 plants had the ability to make, this man was sentenced to 24 years and did like 21 of, of their the 20. 24 years. For growing. For growing some marijuana plants. Right, uh, which is now legal. Which is now legal. Correct. Uh, now... That's a whole another argument. I don't think we're going to get to go back and say, well, it's legal now, so we should release everybody who got arrested when it wasn't. That you don't buy that? I don't buy that. That's how it was illegal then. Like, you don't have that. Really, just not even a relevant argument. <laughs> like, just because it's legal guess, now. It's legal now. With but it wasn't legal then. But, Stephen, what they're saying is so if, if you followed the law then and just waited until it became legal, then you'll be okay. But, 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 but Stephen, what the, the argument is, if it's legal now, that kind of tells you that it's not as bad how can it be legal now? Illegal back then, but I'm. But it's, it's legal on state levels in certain states. Federally, it is still illegal. Period. Period. Right. So, so you you don't understand and, the argument at and, all. And I understand it. I just don't think it makes a lot of sense. Okay. Uh, something that was illegal then, and you were punished for it then, you don't get to go back and reap the benefits of it now being legal. Gotcha. Like, that's not how it works. Okay. All right. So one more thing, if you could change anything on the books. Like, for example, uh, Jay-Z did a documentary on Meek Mill, and, man, they gave him probation for, like, 
don't quote me, but like 15 years probation and you 17 years old. So you on probation until you're like 35 years old. And he, he, you know, he, he popped a wheelie on the, on this video. He's working. Mm -hmm. He's an artist. You know, the guys are riding the four wheelers. He popped the wheelie and don't, don't quote me, but there were some props on the video that were guns, but because I'm on probation from 15 years ago, I can't be around nobody that's a felon on the video shoot with a gun. Do you feel like these long probations where, I, where I'm on probation 10 plus years, I'm probably gonna violate at some point, even if I didn't mean to? I think it's much more likely that you will have someone who have a minor violation. But I mean, I think when you look into those lengthy probation sentences, yes. and I don't, you know, I'm not, I'm somewhat familiar with the Meek Mill sit, but I didn't, it's nothing that I've drew enough interest to really look into. Right. Uh, but you got to look into people's criminal history. You got to look into, you know, how do we get to 15 years probation? Right. Um, what led up to that? I mean, how many times was he arrested prior to then and put on a year or two probation? And what then I'm saying is a long extensive? probation, I'm probably going to violate. Then, then you have to be that much more intentional because you've gotten yourself in that situation. So now I've got to be that much more intentional to make sure that I don't violate on these next 15 years because I understand that had it not been for my own actions... I wouldn't be supervised but, by these people for the next 15 but years. But, Stephen, it's so, in our community, we, we kind of talked about it. It's so lopsided. The reason I'm in here in the first place is because the conditions oftentimes warrant me to have to do something extra. I'm not saying I have to do I it. Think you don't have to. You chose to. I chose to because my options were limited, though. So you thought. Not just, the same person we're talking about is a millionaire. So, again, it wasn't that you had options. It just wasn't coming as quickly as he wanted it to. So he chose other ways to go about trying to get what he thought he wanted to get. Right. And not, not everybody has that, that, that luxury. Not everybody's fortunate enough to turn it around in the way that he did. Right. So some people are, do have limited options. But even in limited options, you still have the option to do the right thing. Okay. So when you choose to do the wrong thing, All right. what's the points come with that? Okay, so I'm going to take you here. You do know that the federal government floods our community with drugs. Absolutely. Okay. So, Stephen, if you give impoverished people of any kind and you aid and abed and assist them and flood our communities with guns and illegal um, substances, how are you locking us up for something you provide? Because it's still illegal. So we take the bait. We got to be smart enough not to take the bait. We got to. Why are so, they baiting so, us? Because they, they know we're going to take it. Like, I'm going to go like, same reason I would go out to this pond and throw a, a, a hook with a worm because I know a fish out there is going to bite it. Right. I wouldn't fish with something that I knew they wouldn't bite, right? I, I, why would I do that if my goal is to catch the fish? So, again, we know the system isn't for us. I'm not saying that the system is designed for us. Right. It's actually targeting us. Right. So, if we're the targets and they're hunting, then they're going to come out with something that's going to attract us. So, what's attracting us? Quick, fast money. So, hey, I can go and flood y'all and give you this money real quick because I know you're going to take it. Right. You're going to take these drugs. You're going to go ahead. You're going to make your money. You're going to be real flashy when you're doing it. Then I'm going to come and get you. And then you're going to holler, well, y'all gave it to me in the first place, but you didn't have to sell it. Because just like you have, like, like we, our communities have availability to these drugs, so do every other community. No. Yeah, they do. <laughs> no. They do. They, Stephen, they, they not, they're not flooding, Bill. They're not flooding. They don't have to. They give them to us, and we taking it out there. They don't have to flood them. Yeah. But I guarantee if we stopped, if we stopped taking the bait, you got to find another community to take that to because you got to get your money. So you got to find somebody else to do it for you. They don't have to find nobody else to do it because we still willing to do it. Despite knowing that when we get jammed up in the system, we're going to get it 10 times as worse. Right. As somebody in that other neighborhood that we're going and selling into that, that's not being flooded by the government, but we know we're going to get it. So, again, as long as we continue to take the bait, why, why, why but, fish or something different? But what you're doing is you're, you're absolving the U.S. government of their responsibility and their role in it. I'm not absolving. I'm just fighting what you can fight. So can, can we change the U.S. government? And, no, we can't mm -hmm. on, on that. But we can start at a micro level and say, hey, I, I can't. All right, we ain't powerful enough right now to change the government. That's not happening for us. <laughs> right, but right. what we can do is we can start in these little projects and say, hey, man, we're going to do something different. Don't, don't, take, don't, the don't take the bait. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's going to be out here. It's going to be easy. It's going to look real appealing to you. And, and, yeah, all the luxury things are going to come with it. But you know, man, if you get jammed with two or three bags of this, then, then you're probably getting ready to go for 20 years. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Where somebody else of an, another race can get caught with the same thing, and they may go home on probation. On probation. You got to know when it's stacked against you, and you got to play your hand. But if you choose to gamble with it, 
deal with it. You got to deal with it. That's my opinion. Right, it's accountability. <laughs> it is accountability. It's accountability. But I just man. don't like when the game and the rules start with us selling and not the government providing it for us to sell. I don't think the boats that come there, over man, that are imported here and certain eyes are being turned to the docks that let it in and then it hits our community. And now we supposed to just be like, oh, we supposed to accept 35, 40, 50 years in the breakdown of our families. But it wouldn't be a family breakdown or generational breakdown if y'all didn't put it in here in the first place. I the argument has to but start. Can we, but can, and I don't think the argument doesn't start there. I think the argument just starts with the point where we can put some action in. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, the point to where we can implement or influence some kind of change. You're not gonna stop the drug from coming in. Mm -hmm. that, that's been happening so yeah, it's a billion dollar industry. You're not going to mm -hmm. stop that. Mm -hmm. So you have to go there. What, you, what can you stop? Mm -hmm. I can't stop the drug, but I can stop my kids from going out there selling. I can stop yeah. the kids in my neighborhood from going out there and, you know, falling subject to now they're sitting in somebody's courtroom getting ready to get these 230 30 month so, sentences. Yeah, yeah, so by the time you go back and calculate that, you realize oh, that's the end of 20 years. Why, why do they do it in months in the fast system? To control reactions. To control your reaction. By the yeah. time you figure that out, they the battle already got you in the back. Yeah. So now when you're 20, yeah. So yeah, yeah, you're already safe and in custody by then. I was in a um, courtroom and I saw a guy get 360 months. And I never forget his grandmother, his grandmother heard months. Mm -hmm. That's exactly what she did. And she was like, thank you, Jesus. <laughs> and, it, and, and look, and I'm decent in math. And I was like, wait a minute, 12 go in the... <laughs> I think that was 30 years he yeah. got. I, I, think, I, I think it was 30 years. He got 360 months. Don't quote me, I'm an English major, but I know she heard months and she said, thank you, Jesus. And by the time he figured it out, he was, in, he was in the back. Already in the back. So it's to the control reaction. To control their reaction time. You, can you imagine the reaction of the family? The, the, when you the, say the, when you say, man, 30 years. <laughs> <laughs> like, like, could you imagine? Yeah, yeah, how, yeah. It would be complete chaos in there. Yeah. So by the time y'all get, get out your cell phone, you don't <laughs> figure that out, man, he already in the back. He gone. He gone. Y'all can have that reaction on your way out the courtroom. Bruh. It's, it's, it's a rough game, man. But... You know, have, you always, become, have you become desensitized? Have you seen it so many times that you don't feel like? No. And I think if you get to that point, you got to stop. On my side. Though, right, Because right, right. now, you know, again, you introduced me as law enforcement. But we're really more rehabilitative, man. I'm, you know, <laughs> we're not out here. I'm not out here arresting people. Um, I'm prosecuting people. That's not what we do. Right, I got now, you. No, by the time you get to us, all that's already been done. Done. You we're, were actually we're, trying to we're, migrate. We're trying to get you back, ready to go back home. Okay. Uh, so, yeah, I think if you're in my position or in, in my line of it, on my side of it, you get the sense of what's what's good. Like, you can't, you can't do that. Right. Like, if, that's, if you're at that point, you need to stop. You need to stop. You need to stop. All right. Well, last question before we go. It's the Instincts Podcast. We always end with this question. Um, we are the highest form or the most intelligent form on a planet of God's creations, humans. Mm. But in the Instincts podcast, we always talk about animals. In my Instinct series, I train on animal behavior and survival instincts and how we should use those same instincts. If you had to pick one animal that you relate to the most, what would it be and why? So I would say a lion, but not this friendly lion that you have up here, though. More of a... <laughs> More of a... I meant to say accept the line. Uh, uh, well, no, nah, but that was going to be my animal before you, before you put it up here. Okay, all right. Uh, but I'm more like a Mufasa type of, type of animal. Maybe. Oh, the other one. The other one. Like, uh, you know, because I can see myself as a protector of what's mine. I'm very protective of what's mine. Okay. Uh, Wait, Mufasa was the dad? Yeah, Mufasa was Who's, the dad. I thought the uncle. Scar. Oh, okay. No, okay. No, 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 not, not Scar. Okay. This is more Muf like Simba. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah you I'm know. A, we, I'm more of a Mufasa. Mufasa, okay. Uh, protector. Very, very protector, provider. Uh, loyal uh, and a leader. You know, I've never been one to follow the masses, as you can see. You know, yeah, uh, clearly. You know, I don't. You know, I'm not. I'm not your typical guy. Got you. Yeah. I understand. Well, hey, to your credit, I give you a hard time, but we do need people <laughs> like you who are helping people migrate their way back into society. We do need people like you who look like us on that side of the fence. I don't agree with everything that the federal government does, obviously. I don't believe everything that we're doing in our community is, is right either. But I will say, I will say, you got your own mind. You always have. You think for yourself. and You don't let um, our, our peers or social media or um, the justice system 
Jade how you feel as a man. And that, that, I, that I will say, you've always held it down. I can tell by the way you defend the Cowboys that no matter what, <laughs> if, you, if you believe that y'all going to the Super Bowl every year. We're going to the Super Bowl this year. definitely if, so. if you believe that. Have you seen us this season, I, I, I've seen your defense. You, okay. I've seen it's, your defense. It's a beast out there, it's right? A, it's, it's a okay. defense. You know, we still got to get, you know, anyway, who am I to talk? Exactly. And I don't I let, think you want to go there. We don't want to go there. You don't want to go there. But you have been strong in your beliefs. You are an opinionated person, and you argue, and you stick to your guns, and that I respect. I that I respect. That. One word to the wise before we go to the kids. Don't come see you. Don't come see me, unless you're visiting. <laughs> Other than that, <laughs> that's it. Steven Riggs, man, it's a great day to change lives. Thank you for joining another episode of the Instincts Podcast. You got any promotions, programs, anything coming up we need to check out? Nah, man. Nah. We just out here doing what we can do to help out. Help out. That's All right, it. cool. i see y'all soon. <laughs> Peace.